Okay, now we're gonna talk about something completely different, yes? So this is the slide that I have to put it. So we are talking about pathway network analysis and what I'm going to cover is basically four different things. It's introduction to pathway network analysis, the sources on pathways and networks, overview of the enrichment analysis. It's probably the most important part of this talk. And I'm going to show you a very small and cute example of how we are analyzing the large-scale cancer genomic data. So the first question is, why do we need this pathway analysis? And uh, the pretty straight uh, answer is that it helps us to reduce the data size um, of our high throughput studies. Like a very simple example, uh, we just uh, sequenced about um, 250 geno um, holodomes in the esophageal adenocarcinoma. And uh, it happened to be that about 15,000 genes are carrying at least one mutation in those 250 patients. I mean, how can we generate any hypothesis based on the 15,000 genes? It's, it's pretty much impossible. So that's how uh, path analysis is helping. So I don't think you should submit all 15,000 genes into the pathway enrichment analysis. You probably want to reduce those number of genes by selecting those genes that are mutated in five more samples or apply different kind of other filterings. But that's why we need it. And basically the second point is uh, the consequence of the first one that increases our statistical power. So we are not analyzing 15,000 entities, we are analyzing maybe on the handy number of 10 or 15. Next point, gene is very rare, operates on its own. Every, almost every gene in the human genome has uh, activators, inhibitors, so the transcriptional activation is uh, regulated by somebody. So we cannot just look at the gene as a one single separated entity. And uh, as an example, I'm going to show it in my slides, um, probably you know that the majority of those genes are uh, mutated at a very low level. So majority, it's like 3% of uh, patients are carrying those mutations, 2% and lower. It's a very small number of genes that's uh, mutated at the level of 30%, like P53. So we have to make sense out of these genes. And of course, uh, Pathway analysis helps us to generate a meaningful hypothesis. So it's, it's hard to generate hypothesis if you have a zinc finger 418 mutated, but if you see HFR signaling pathway is enriched, it's, it's kind of the way to think what is my next step in my analysis. So to do a pathway analysis, you need three different things. The first one is a biological hypothesis. This is optional, but it's very helpful. The second one is the actual list of your genes or proteins that uh, came out, we will find later, and sources of pathways and, and networks. So, biological question or hypothesis is actually what do you want to accomplish with your list? So when uh, I participated in a number of workshops and sometimes I was asking this question, so what is your biological hypothesis? And people were saying something like, I want to identify all genes that are regulated in my microarray. This is not a biological hypothesis. It should be something like, uh, I believe that uh, EGFR signaling is uh, altered after I put or uh, stimulated my cells with a drug X. Yes? So, summarize biological processes in your study. Perform differential analysis. What pathways are different between samples or between uh, treated and untreated cell lines? Find a controller. So if something happened to you, you want to find the transcriptional factor that's responsible for all these changes. Maybe identify new pathways. Maybe you can find something new, publish it, and send email to Reactome. I'm going to cover Reactome later. That guys, I, 
made this discovery and we can uh, catalog a new pathway, discover a new gene function and uh, find any kind of correlation with your disease or clinical data. So the second point that we need for the pathway analysis, it's a gene list. So where it comes from? The first thing is and the most obvious, it's from your high throughput studies, sequencing, gene profiling, and so on and so forth. The second one, as Junjun showed you right now, from public data portals like ICGC, TCGA, COSMIC, and so on. And the third one, it's uh, less obvious from the manual or automated literature reviews. If you want to describe any kind of process, you might read a uh, hundred publications and find a number of genes that are associated with this new or rare process. And for example, the Poptator is a um, biocuration tool that helps you to do it in an automated way. It's a very cool software. And the last one, it's a pathway and network information that we need to do the pathway analysis. So in this uh, uh, lecture, I'm going to cover GEO, it's a gene ontology, pathway databases, and a little bit about the network databases. So what is the gene ontology? Any questions, guys? Okay. So what is, on, what is ontology in, in general? Ontology, it's a data model that represents knowledge as a set of concepts. Like, for example, what is a berry? Berry is a strawberry, blueberry, blackberry, so on. But at the same time, berry is food, yes? At the same time, berry is a plant, and so on. So, like this, you can create a very complicated set of terms. The same thing, uh, Gene ontology consortium is trying to do with the biological uh, terms or biological um, entities. So it's a dictionary. And it deals with the biological phrases or terms like uh, protein kinases, apoptosis, and membranes, and trying to establish those connections like berry is a food, berry is a uh, whatever. Uh, it's not static, it's constantly updated. And it's not only covering the human genome, it's covering all kinds of genomes. And uh, the very ambitious task, task is to synchronize these terms across all genomes. And uh, it's publicly available for free. You can go there, download, use it, it's for you. So what GEO covers? There are three major sections, and probably when Junjun did his enrichment analysis, you, you saw it already. It's a cellular component, molecular function, and biological process. So cellular component is basically covering the localization of the genes that you're talking about. Molecular function, it's, uh, it's more about so like interactions, uh, the molecular interactions between ligand and uh, receptor, the catalytic reactions, and so on. And biological process, it's like cell division and uh, similar. So, like, for my research, uh, biological process is um, the most useful one. But, of course, you can run enrichment analysis uh, against all of them and just uh, use the information that you're gaining. So, what is the structure? The structure, as I said, is very complicated. And in majority of the biological, uh, in the enrichment test, you're not going to see it. You're not going to use it. So you just need to keep in mind that that's what gene ontology is about. So, um, like, for example, I don't think you can see it here, but you should, have, you should be able to see it in your printouts. So we see, like, uh, cell death is a parent of the program cell death, and uh, program cell death is a parent of the apoptosis. And uh, apoptosis is a parent of the B cell apoptosis, but all these belong to the biological processes. It's one of those terms that I showed here. So it describes multiple levels of details of gene function, and uh, different kind of terms can have different number of parents and/or children. 
So this is the structure of gene ontology. Questions? So now I'm going to talk about the pathways. So it's pretty similar, but it's not the same. For your enrichment analysis, you won't see any differences, but there is a conceptual, difference, conceptual differences between those two resources. So pathway databases, advantages of those, it's usually highly curated. You can see the biological view of this process that you're interested in. So the cause and effect captured. Like if you're stimulating the, the, with EGFR, what's going to happen at the very end? And uh, most of those uh, resources have these uh, uh, very nice uh, pictures uh, that is very understandable and even could be used in the publications or the teaching. Disadvantages? very sparse coverage of the genome. And why? Because everybody wants to study P53, and nobody wants to study zinc finger 418. That's why we have a lot of papers about the first gene, but probably no papers about the last, second gene, yes. So it's your fault, not mine. And uh, different databases disagree on the boundaries of the pathways. That's not funny. That's already our problem. So basically, if you are downloading P53 signaling pathway from CAD, Panther, and Reactome, they, might, they will overlap, but not 100%. So every curator, unfortunately, has his own representation of what P53 signaling is about. So today I'm going to talk about the reactome. This is one of the pathway databases, or we, are call, we call it knowledge basis. And um, right now it's the richest data, pathway databases that exist in the world. I'm talking about the human. Um, first thing, it's hand curated. And we have a very rigorous curation standards. Every reaction that you see in the reactome is actually traceable to the primary literature. So right now we have about close to 2,000 human pathways, and they're covering um, close to 9,000 proteins. And it's open access. So why it's important? Because the second biggest database is CAG, and unfortunately, about three years ago, it became commercial, so you can still use it for free. But to download data, you have to pay a license. And maybe for a big institution like mine, it's not a big deal, but if you're working in a small lab, it's, it's, it might be a problem, yes. So just several screenshots how Reactome is organized. I just randomly selected one of the pathways. It's a G1S DNA damage checkpoint, whatever it means. And um, it's, the all pathways are organized in their hierarchical way. So this is our pathway of the interest, and it belongs to the cell cycle checkpoints, and cell cycle checkpoint belongs in, in its turn to cell cycle. So it's pretty similar like what we saw in uh, uh, gene ontology. Then we have this very nice representation of the actual uh, interactions. So the bluish ones, um, it's a protein um, complexes, and the greenish one is uh, proteins itself, and it's capture all post-translational modification, if it happens in this case. And it has a lot of uh, small molecules like ATP, uh, ATPD. So this is the uh, zoom in the representation of the reaction. Um, for example, the P53 after it's phosphorylated, it's actually activated the expression of the CTKNA. And this is my uh, uh, below each uh, pathway, we have a short description of this pathway with some uh, reference links. And this is my favorite feature. It actually was um, uh, adapted from the protein, uh, human protein atlas, and shows you the expression of your 
genes of interest across different human tissues. So like we see P53 is actually pretty uh, evenly, the expression is pretty evenly distribution, whereas the CDKN1A, it's going up and down in different tissues. And you also can able to download this data in different kind of format and use it wherever, wherever you want. So, and the last point is uh, networks. So, pathway versus networks. What is the difference? Uh, this is the, the beginning of the EGFR signaling. This is basically the same thing, only this is pathway and this is the network. The differences are pretty obvious. So, this part is very detailed. High, there is a, a lot of details, like for example, after interaction EGFR with EGF, the EGFR is getting dimerized, and then uh, after phosphorylation, it's uh, active, uh, the phosphorylation is activated by this protein. In the network, the value of each gene is equal. There is no inhibitors, there is no activators. They're all pretty much the same, and they look the same. So, uh, uh, in here we are capturing biochemical reactions. Here the overview is basically very abstractional. In some of the network you can have a directed or indirected uh, di directed reactions, but in most of the cases it just the capture the interaction. So pathways are pretty small scale, the networks are huge. So this network is a part of this huge network over here on the corner. And um, all pathways are retrieved from literature, whereas the networks is from literature and omics data. So it's, let's say, less reliable. So what kind of networks we have? Um, so as I said, uh, networks can be generated either automatically or through curation or both. And uh, it's uh, definitely if it's generated through, through automatically, it's covering significantly higher uh, portion of the genome than, for example, reactome. And um, re the re relationships between uh, genes are actually more tentative than in the pathways. And there, are, there is a list of the most popular sources of curated networks, like, for example, Biobreed, Intact, Mint, and our favorite one is Reactome Function Interaction Network. So it's based on the curated data and machine learning, and right now it consists of 11,000 human genes and 180,000 interactions. So that's how it looks like. And it's only 5% of this network. So these little dots are proteins, and these little interactions, sexual interactions between proteins. And uh, the network analysis uh, in a very simplistic form looks like this. This is the network, and this is list of genes that were upregulated, downregulated in your any kind of study. So you're basically taking those list of genes and projecting into the network. And after that, the, the, the software is looking for the interactions between your genes. So most of the cases is finding this big cluster of genes, and some of the genes are not connected, and some of them are connected between each other. Optionally, you can add the subset of so-called linkers. Linkers are the genes that do not belong to your list, but helps to connect all genes on your list in one big sub-network. And this sub-network we usually call it a disease-specific sub-network, prostate, prostate cancer-specific sub-network, and so on. And then you're removing this background and you're playing with this sub-network. So what we can do, you can run the clustering analysis, you can uh, calculate some uh, uh, property of the network, like protein degrees, betweenness, closeness, and uh, it's basically we need another lecture to cover the graph analysis. So takeaway message, there are goal, pathway, and network-based ways to analyze your gene list. 
And uh, the best way is to do all three. So now we are switching to the enrichment test. So this is the very uh, usual output from the enrichment test. And uh, there are a number of the softwares online that is doing it. And I just using, I'm just using the screenshot from the ICGC portal. So what we see here, so I submitted the gene list that consisted of 130 genes. It doesn't really matter in this case what is all this 130 genes about. And here we see the list of pathways from reactome that are enriched. On uh, this side, there was a blue highlighting. It's uh, pathway IDs that are going to lead you to the reactome website and actual representation of this pathway. Number of genes that belong to this pathway. Let's choose something meaningful. Signaling by error before there are 294 genes, and eight genes of those are belong to my list. So I'm skipping this part. This is Jun Jun covered in his lecture. And what is important for us is the p value and adjusted p value. So the question is how this p value is calculated. To calculate the p-value, we need an enrichment test. So for enrichment test, we need three different things. Your gene of list, uh, your list of genes, the pathways, like reactome, and so-called background list. It's basically a list of genes that were tested in your set. Then there is a black box where the calculations are going on. And the output is just it looks like the, the, the screenshot that I showed you on my previous site. So enrichment test in majority of the cases is done using so-called hypergeometrical test. So how does it work? It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. So let's assume we created any kind of microarray that consists of 1,000 human genes. You know, in the old days, there were a lot of those customized arrays uh, with not a, that no, were not covering the whole genomes like in our days, but just a particular subset of genes, yes? And this is our background list. That's exactly what I was talking here. Out of those 1,000 genes, 100 belong to any kind of pathway X, EGFR signaling, for example. We did any kind of assay, and we found out that five genes are actually enriched, or five, five, gene, five genes are actually um, significant. They are highly mutated, or they are upregulated, downregulated, whatsoever. And of those five genes, three belong to the EGFR signaling. So is it significant? So to calculate that, we use this formula. But, you know, like, don't get afraid. You're not going to see this formula anymore probably in your life, yes? So this formula consists of three combination functions. And uh, uh, I'll try to explain it, what it's doing. And uh, the values uh, for those variables are actually um, shown here. So n equal 1,000 is the total size of our microarray. M is the number of EGFR signaling genes that belong to this pathway. N is actually the number of genes that we selected for analysis. And K is the number of genes that actually belong to GFR from our list. Four numbers, very important. Yes? And we are putting all these four numbers in this formula. And what is this formula is calculating? It's actually, for example, here, number of combinations that exist, to number of ways to select n out of big N. Like how many times we can select those five genes out of 1,000 genes? 
The same thing is here. How many ways exist to select three genes here out of 100 EGFR-related genes? And pretty similar over here. N minus M, N minus M, it's 900. It's actually genes on my array that do not belong to EGFR signaling. And N minus K, it's two genes that I selected that also do not belong to the EGFR signaling. And so the calculating of this formula is actually giving you this p-value, which is, as you see, pretty significant. So I told you about the background list. So all genes that were tested. So as you see in the formula 1000, it plays a significant role. What does it mean? So if you're doing the microarray that selected all genes, you don't care about that. It's going to be, what, 25,000? How many genes do we have in the human genome? Depends on the array, yes. If you're doing any kind of customized array, so this number will be reduced. Or, for example, like in our days, a lot of people are doing target sequencing. So they're selecting any kind of gene panel of, let's say, 100, 200 genes, and sequencing deeply only those genes. So doing phosphoanalysis, you should keep it in mind, yes. So uh, hypergeometrical test is a very, very useful tool. And it's not only applicable for pathway analysis. It can be useful in many, many different ways. So, and uh, to do it, you don't need to use that complicated formula. You just need to Google hypergeometrical test or hypergeometrical test calculator, and that's what I found. And it's basically the same thing. Population size, 1,000 letters might be different. Be, be careful about that. Number of the successes, 100. The, one, the number of the EGFR signaling genes. Sample size, it's the genes that we select as they enriched. And number of successes in sample, three. And if you press the calculate button, you're going to get approximately the same probability. Yes? But this is not the end of the story. P-value should not drive your decision on what pathway to select for further validation. Why? Because there are a lot of pathways. So we should always think about the multiple test correction thing. And what does it mean? So if we are randomly draw so many times five genes out of our, out of our bucket, at one point, in average in 100,000 draws, we're going to select the subset of genes that all of them belong to the EGFR signaling. And that's not what we want, right? So um, it means that we have to penalize. Like I just mentioned that there are 2,000 pathways in uh, just the reactome. There are some resources that doing enrichment analysis not only uh, against uh, reactome databases, but all reactomes, all pathway databases together. And altogether, it could be 10,000 um, uh, pathways. So some of the pathways that came up significant on your list might be just due to random chance. So... Um, so there are different ways to, to fix this problem. And um, at this point, I had like four or five additional slides, but uh, Michelle cut them down, and she said that I'm talking too much. And I just need to introduce the, the concept of the, uh, the multiple test correction. There are different ways to do it. The most um, uh, famous one or usable one, it's Bonferroni correction and FDR, false discovery rate, you probably all heard about it. Yes, and um, uh, I prefer FDR because Bonferroni might be a little bit too strict and sometimes it's just washing out the information that might be useful. But what is, what is FDR? FDR is false discovery rate, yes. And um, in most of the cases, uh, people are establishing at level of 0.1. So what does it mean? It means that 10% of your enriched pathways could be due to random chance. 
Like for example, 10 pathways are significant and FDRI is 0.1. So one out of 10 will be due to random chance. But nine out of 10, true positives. Perfect. If you're selecting, if you are increasing FDR and putting it at the level of 15%, you're probably gonna get, no, well, let's say 20%, it's easier to calculate. You're probably gonna get 15 uh, enriched pathways, which is kind of looks better, but then the false discovery rate is 0.2 multiply by 15, you're gonna get three pathways, which is false positive, which is not what you want. So you decide, it's a philosophical question, but I really don't like papers where FDI is 30% or higher. It's kind of, it's nonsense. So takeaway message, hypergeometrical test is a powerful tool. Don't forget multiple test correction and keep in mind N, number of genes and proteins in your total population. It might influence your final study. And uh, the fun part, it's a, uh, uh, pathway analysis of the large-scale cancer genomic sets. So I mentioned that already. Um, this is a very, very usual graph for cancer genomics. So we took uh, 52 pancreatic cancers and we found uh, 200 recurrently mutated genes and they plotted it here. So on this scale we have a number of patients and these are the percentage of the patients and there's all these genes. So that's, that's called long tail of cancer genes. So there's the KRAS, a very interesting gene that mutated in about 95% of pancreatic cancer patients. P53, it's about 30%. Another sodium channel. But the rest of those is just very low. So how to make sense out of this information? So to do this, we generated this workflow uh, of pathway network analysis. So you generate your list of genes, you run your enrichment analysis, you can use ICGC portal or Reactome portal or G-Profiler. G-Profiler is actually very advanced uh, and it's taking into account your background list uh, as well. So you can browse through your significant pathway in Reactome or whatever. Uh, tool we are using, and then you are building the protein interaction subnetwork the way I showed you in one of my slides. You can run the clustering algorithm and then run enrichment analysis of each module of each cluster separately. Drill down to understand the molecular mechanism, validate your model, usually it's in the wet lab, and publish manuscript. Yes. So, and that's how. Yeah, majority of those uh, uh, steps could be done using Reactome Functional Interaction Network Cytoscape plugin. Who have heard about the Cytoscape before? Yes. Um, yeah, it should be your best friend for this type of analysis. So, um, and that's how it looks like. And I think it's beautiful. So basically, all genes, it's a pancreatic cancer specific subnetwork. The blue dots, it's genes. And the lines, it's interactions between genes. And genes are clustered into the modules. Basically clustered together, those genes, they are highly interacting with each other. The bigger the, bigger the, the, the node, the higher mutational rate has. And then each module was annotated with the pathway enrichment um, tool, like for example, module five uh, enriched in the axon guidance. Actually, this pathway that comes up in every single cancer I analyzed, I don't know why. Then we have, for example, module translation. Some of them have several annotation, Hitchhawk and TCGF beta signaling. Uh, of course, CRB, RBB signaling, P53 signaling, and this big node is a P53. That's the way it goes. And takeaway message number three. So try different tools. Don't be shy. Issue of non-relevant enriched pathways. I mean, um, 
React Tom is a huge resource and it's trying to cover different uh, fields of human activities. And if you are analyzing any kind of uh, drug acts and you stimulated your cell lines with this drug, and then you run your pathway analysis and you got tuberculosis or HIV, HPV uh, infection or something like that, so it's most likely not really relevant to your study. So don't publish it, exclude it. Be careful, but exclude it, yes. Um, in the ideal world, um, of course, you should create your own uh, list of pathways that you are interested in. So you're taking those 1800 uh, plus reactome pathways and actually selecting before seeing your gene list those that might be relevant to your study, but it's a lot of work. And in most of the cases, you will need some kind of very basic programming skills. But just, just think. So if no significant pathways were detected and you excluded all possible mistakes, don't get disappointed. Maybe it's something new that we've never seen before. And um, yes. All lectures, uh, it's just additional message, that all lectures are available here and you can gain a lot more information about the pathway network analysis, including the Cytoscape and our plugin for the Cytoscape. Questions?